Hello watch enthusiasts! Now the sizing of a wristwatch is rather an important point to be able to enjoy a watch and really be able to make the most of it on a daily basis. And for no other sort of watch is this quite so prominent as on dive watches with their raised bezels and generally larger cases as a result of their water resistance. And despite the very extensive coverage that a lot of uh, a lot of journalists um, and uh, and people talking about watches tend to put towards smaller dive watches, the truth is that for the vast majority of consumers, whether a watch is 39mm or 43mm is really of little, uh, little consequence until one actually tries the watch on. And so as a result, today I'd like to speak about smaller dive watches, or rather dive watches for smaller wrists, because some of the watches in this video are deceptively large if you look at their specifications. And so what I've tried to focus on in this video is a set of five dive watches at different price ranges which offer you a very comfortable and ergonomic fit, irrespective of how small your wrist might be. Now the first watch to speak about is a model from Seiko, and it's a new version of their Tuner dive watch. However, this is a solar quartz watch, and a piece which doesn't quite fall into their professional diving range, but still falls into the bottom of their prospects range, and does provide a very sound quality watch, as far as a dive watch is concerned, with a lot of features which are very interesting, and also very high quality. And having handled this piece on several occasions, it really is an impressive model for the price. And to really understand the design of this watch, this piece is designed to, to follow after the, in the footsteps of the 1978 Seiko Tuner, which was their professional dive watch. And that piece had a 600 meter water resistance, and was designed to resist the, the dangers of helium ingress in the early days of saturation diving. And whilst that piece was an early application of a quartz movement to make a watch more accurate and much more resilient, this piece takes that on in the form of this solar model, and this uses the V157 quartz movement, which is accurate to plus or minus 15 seconds a month, and uh, and has a solar a solar rechargeable battery, so it actually charges through the dial, which is a very very convenient function and means that you can go for much much longer periods of time without having a, a battery change. As a result of the fact that the watch will recharge itself, really it's only when the uh, the internal components start to fail. Uh, with it, with it, it will in fact uh, need to uh, to have a service, which means it's much more like a, a mechanical watch in that sense than a quartz movement. And the advantage of this also is the fact that the accuracy is much higher than what you would expect from an equivalent uh, an equivalent automatic movement. But the general build also takes some of the advantages of those of those professional dive watches from the 1970s because it also gains this rather marvellous shroud, albeit not in ceramic in this case, but rather in this uh, in this format, it comes in the form of this resin or plastic, which is extremely well finished and well detailed with this matted surface, and depending upon the version it comes in different colours too, and this is bolted directly to the case, so if it's damaged you can simply unscrew those screws and replace it with a new one. Underneath the watch is stainless steel, but depending upon the version comes either in fully black PVD, with these golden elements, which, by the way, is not a, a somewhat lustrous um, element to this watch, but rather is a simulation of the, the design of the original, which had this coloration because it had a special coating to resist scratches, and in fact this watch does have an extremely scratch-resistant coating in order to, to be able to protect it. And underneath this watch is domed hardlex crystal. Its dial is also a replica, or at least a, a very close remake, of the dial of those original pieces from the 1970s, which I think is a wonderful inspiration to take, and really adds to the value of this timepiece. It should be noted there is also the paddy version of this watch, which features a, a blue and red colour theme, and has a slightly more detailed dial with these waves going across it, which is a less classic configuration, and certainly I think I would go for the black version, but it's certainly an interesting choice if you want something a bit different. But where dimensions are concerned, and I'm aware this is the key focus of the video, this watch is able to, to be very wearable for most wrists, because it's mo almost circular, and so whilst it's 46.7mm across, which is normally not a small size at all, that's almost exactly the lug-to-lug -lug length, which means this watch actually wears much, much smaller, and thanks to its 12.4mm thickness, which is remarkably thin for a 200m water-resistant watch, with a certain amount of anti-magnetism too, this is a very, very wearable timepiece, and for just under £300 it's a very impressive package with a lot of history, a lot of design, and a lot of engineering going into it. Now the next piece is rather a curious one, because I was considering trying to put a watch in a price bracket between this Zodiac Super Seawolf 53 and that Seiko I showed you, but I think considering what's available on the market, this £700 Zodiac is such a good deal for the price at which you can get it for, that it doesn't really make sense compromising for a dive watch in the smaller sizes for around £500. You may as well spend the extra £200 and have a higher level of quality. 
And so that's the, the thought behind this piece, which is the Zodiac Super Seawolf 53. And this is a model which is very impressive with regards to the detailing and the quality. And Zodiac is rather an old brand in terms of their history, and were alongside uh, Blancpain in producing the first dive watches in 1953. And it is true that Zodiac today are owned by the Fossil Group, and for some people this is a no-no, but at least in my eyes and having met the people from Zodiac, I must admit I don't see it this way. And the reason for that is because whilst they're, they're owned by the Fossil Group, their actual management and control of what's going on within the brand is very much separate. And so in that regard, they're able to benefit from the immense funding that one can have from being controlled by a large group, whilst also having the freedom of a micro-brand. So one has this interesting dichotomy with this brand, which allows them to create some very, very interesting products. And this is no exception. And this piece is a 200 meter dive watch, which takes inspiration from the 1950s and 60s. And this model is rated at 40 millimeters wide, but that's really at the bezel. In fact, it's 39 across the, the sides of the case and then it's 13 millimeters thick. And this means the watch is very, very wearable on most wrists. And having uh, owned one of these for a few months now, I can say that it's, it's a thoroughly wearable watch in terms of being wearable with both dress cuffs and indeed as a more casual type of timepiece. Now, the watch itself has a, a beautiful vintage aesthetic to it with a polished case on the top and then vertical brushing on the sides of the case with a small screw down crown. The movement is uh, is an interesting piece as well, because it's the STP3-13, and this is the movement maker which only makes movements um, within the, the Fossil Group. Now, they are also sold to other brands, but it is an independent maker of movements. And these movements are based on the ETA2824, but in this most modern version are, are fully decorated, which you wouldn't get for the same price with an ETA, have a, a longer power as over 44 hours, and also have a uh, grading whereby they're built to a specification where any of these movements are, are, are specified to a point where they are of a high enough quality to pass COSC certification to be a chronometer, even if they don't eventually go through that certification due to the price. One also has the interesting point of having a swan neck regulator, which means the watch can be regulated much more finely than a normal ETA movement, and thus creates a very interesting um, demonstration of what can be done for this £700-£1,000 price mark. And these watches come in a variety of different versions, but all share the same general specifications, with a flat dial with this very vintage aesthetic and this contrasting colour for the minute hand. The dials are also exquisitely well detailed, and, uh, and really have, have gained a lot of praise in terms of being very well designed, but also very well executed. So most notably the hands are extremely flat in their execution, with extremely sharp edges which are simply uncharacteristic for this price range whilst one has detailing which one wouldn't expect to see, and a rather attractive mineral crystal inset bezel. Then one has a, uh, a very heavily bubble-domed style of, of box crystal in sapphire on the front of the watch, which allows one to have higher scratch resistance as well. Now these watches come um, on bracelets or straps depending upon the model, and thus range between 700 and 1000 pounds, whilst each has their benefits, the straps being supple and very comfortable, and the, the bracelets being extremely well detailed with very fine finishing throughout, and interesting expandable clasps on springs. And really the final point to consider with these pieces is that because Zodiac operate on a relatively small scale, these watches are produced also in relatively small numbers, and this is why Zodiac watches have a rather quick turnover in terms of, of new models um, being released and then going becoming discontinued and, and sold out, and that's because actually a very small number of these watches end up being made, and whilst I can't, qu can't quote any, any specific numbers, the individual numbers of even non-limited edition versions will be in the hundreds, not the thousands or the tens of thousands, as you would expect to see with other brands. And so if you do buy one of these watches, you can be sure that once that watch sells out, they won't be making it again, which is a very, very interesting concept, and I think adds value to a product as being far more individual. The next watch I'd like to speak about is a long-time celebrated piece. This is the Oris Aquis. And Oris replaced the old Aquis with a new streamlined version, with sharper hands and uh, an altogether more modern set of design cues, which I think looks marvellous. And this piece was then updated from its 43mm size to also include a 39.5mm version in the range. And whilst the 43mm size with its kettle-shaped case and, and somewhat bulky proportions was a piece for larger wrists, this model in 39.5mm is perhaps more wearable for people who prefer a smaller timepiece. And whilst I wouldn't discourage anyone from going for the larger size, and I probably would go for the larger size if I was buying one, I can certainly see the appeal of the smaller model. 
And this piece is stainless steel, of course, and, and comes with this very detailed case, which is an almost perfect match of the, the full-size model, with brushed sides to that kettle-shaped case, a polished edge to the bezel, as well as polished areas throughout the case, and of course that customary bolted-on crown guard. And the general design of this watch is completely unique, and, uh, and really has become a, an icon of the Oris range. And this watch is rather interesting after speaking about that Zodiac, because whilst the quality, I feel, of the Zodiac and the Oris are, are similar and comparable, the way these things are executed are incredibly different. And the Oris, by contrast to the somewhat more dressy, somewhat more informal appeal of that, to that Zodiac, is far more professional, far more serious, and has a higher water resistance of 300 metres. Also, these Orises have ceramic bezels across the range, and there are three variants of these watches available. The most sedate has a matte black dial with a brushed ceramic bezel insert, then one has a sunburst a grey black dial with a, a, a polished style of black bezel insert in ceramic, and then you have the sunburst blue with the same black polished ceramic bezel insert as the, um, the, the sunburst black. And this creates an interesting range with, uh, with a variation in different forms, and all of them offer a, a very interesting appeal and an aesthetic whilst also having very well-constructed bezels, and of course that ceramic will be extremely scratch-resistant and very wearable um, in, in future, as it's not the sort of look which, uh, which will go out of fashion. Then of course one has a large crown on the side of the case, which adds a certain gravitas to the whole appeal of the watch, and the dial of the piece is also very well executed, and quite simple in its flat expanse, but beautifully detailed whether you go for a matte version or a sunburst model in whichever colour you happen to choose, and to add symmetry the date is placed at 6 o'clock which allows you to be able to tell which way around the watch is without having to have a, a very radically different marker at 12 o'clock, whilst the one on this watch is ever so slightly elongated. The hands are also typical Oris style, with that double loom plot on the hour hand and a, a longer minute hand, whilst one also has an interesting counterweight to the seconds, and I think the detail on the hands is very well done with a, a polished be bevel around the, the top of the hand, giving a nice curve and a general feel of luxury to these pieces. And if you look under the very subtly domed sapphire crystal with anti-reflective coating of this watch, or through the exhibition case back, one sees a Salita SW200, which is renamed the Calibre 733 by Oris. And this gives you automatic winding, 38 hours of power reserve, and has very similar specifications to an ETA2824, or indeed that STP movement in the Zodiac I showed you. And whilst this movement isn't as decorated and doesn't have quite the same, uh, same standards in terms of having that swan neck regulator, it's still a very sound timekeeper, and Oris are known for the quality of their movements. And of course this watch does have that, uh, that famous red rotor that Oris uh, give all of their watches, which I think gives a little bit of, uh, of extra personalisation to the movement of this piece. And in terms of straps and bracelets, there are various options which uh, define the price between £1,400 and £1,520, but of course this watch does have integrated lugs, so you will have to go with an Oris strap, or else have a strap or bracelet made for the watch, which, which can be done but isn't expensive if you want to go down that route. But the options offered are, are very impressive, with a very high quality bracelet, or the rubber strap being a favourite amongst owners due to its nice, uh, nice feel and extremely advanced clasp, whilst there is also a leather strap option if you want it. But overall I think this is a very impressive piece which gives you some of that luxurious feel of something like an Omega Seamaster, but for a much more affordable price, and with an utterly unique style to this watch. Now the penultimate watch in this video is a very impressive technical watch from Zinn, the, the technical watch manufacturer from Germany which has been recognised since the 1960s, and in that period they focused very much on pilot's watches and no-nonsense nonsense instruments to make people's lives easier in the cockpit. But certainly they've broadened their range in, in recent years, and provide technical watches for a number of applications. And the EZM3 is an interesting model because it stands alone in the Zin range, because it shares the case design with some of their pilot's watches, and so is perhaps a little bit less imposing on the wrist and a more wearable size, whilst also having all of the credentials of a professional dive watch, despite being uh, technically the least professional um, dive watch in terms of water resistance in the Zin range, which I find mildly astounding because this is already a 500 meter dive watch beyond the, uh, the depth which the vast majority of divers would ever go to, or even be able to go to with, uh, with normal equipment. And what I think one has to bear in mind whilst looking at this watch is that it goes beyond simply being a dive watch and becomes more of a technical watch to be used by professionals in the field. And so this is why a mechanical watch would be more suitable than, for example, a quartz watch, due to the applications um, around machinery where you wouldn't be able to use quartz technology. And so this does put the whole perspective of this watch into, into a certain context, which I think is rather interesting. 
and the dimensions of this watch are 41mm in diameter by 12.3mm thick. And interestingly, this watch feels in some ways more, more, uh, more simple and more small on the wrist than, for example, a 104, which is a curious comparison, bearing in mind that that is also a 41mm watch with a very similar looking case. But the incredible thing is that at 12.3mm thick, it's still able to retain that 500m water resistance. But the rest of the watch really is designed to be technically functional, because one sees the watch has this bead blasted surface to its stainless steel case to avoid reflections, and also because this is the most technical looking of appearances, whilst the crown has been relocated to the 9 o'clock position instead of 3, so that it's out of the way whilst, uh, whilst being used. And of course you can wear it on the opposite wrist, but really the idea is to move the crown out of the way anyway. Of course, the bezel of this watch is fully graduated in the round, whilst it has a, a glowing triangle at 12 o'clock. And the bezel isn't quite the same build as, for example, a 104 bezel, which appears at first to be very similar, because this bezel doesn't have quite the same height, nor does it have the, the same screwed um, form as the, uh, the, the 104 bezel. However, one has to accept this bezel also reduces the thickness due to this compromise, and so really I think it's a very reasonable choice to make on this watch. Also, there's an anti-reflective sapphire crystal on the front of the watch, which is double anti-reflective coated to give the, the optimal legibility for this watch. And of course, the legibility of this watch is crucial as a mission timer. And so the dial of the watch is matte black to, to reduce reflections, whilst one has the, the, uh, the, the Arabic numerals running around the inside of the dial, and these luminous um, buttons painted directly onto the dial around the edge. You'll also notice that, interestingly, everything that's not crucial to the reading of the time, most notably the date, for example, and some of the writing on the dial, is in red so as not to distract the eye whilst reading the time in a high-stress situation. But inside the watch, it becomes arguably even more interesting. Because the movement inside this watch is the ETA2824, and so as a result is a, a, a very standard movement in terms of being very serviceable, and also very reliable, and indeed the, the best proven movement across the watch industry as far as Swiss mechanical movements go, just because it's so widely used. However, don't let that fool you into thinking this movement isn't of high quality, because they always produce their movements to an extremely high standard, and knowing them, they decorate them very well too. And so this really is a movement you can rely on, especially in the context of this watch, where it also uses Zinn's proprietary lubricants, which are important because this watch is also um, temperature resistant from minus 45 degrees C to plus 80 degrees C, which is a very, very wide bracket in which the watch can operate with, uh, with no deviation in terms of timekeeping, which is a crucial point to this timepiece. But also that doesn't stop there because it also features a soft iron core within it, which allows the movement to be shielded from magnetism, and thus the watch can resist a thousand gauss, which gives it a very high anti-magnetic rating, and about as high as you can go without um, without spending a great deal of money on using anti-magnetic uh, anti features within the movement itself. But also protecting your Swiss-made automatic movement inside this watch, the piece has the, uh, the proprietary ARD humidifying technology that is in use in their technical watches. And what this means is that the watch is filled with argon, which, uh, which prevents the deterioration that would happen to the oils and also the various components in the movement when exposed to, to air over a period of time, but also through the use of a copper sulphate capsule in the side of the case, it's able to absorb any moisture that happens to find its way into the case over time, and so is able to protect the movement whilst you can see what state the copper sulphate is in, judging from it going from, from white when it doesn't have any humidity in it at all, all the way through to blue when it becomes hydrated and you need to have it changed by Zinn. And so it's these elements which make this watch such a good value product, whether you go for it on a, a leather strap for a lesser price of £1,615, or you go for a metal bracelet for 1790 with the, the rubber strap also within that range. Now the final watch in this list is arguably the most predictable, but I think simply couldn't be left out of this list because it is undoubtedly one of the best small dive watches on the market. And this is the Tudor Black Bay 58, the 39mm dive watch which I think has really rounded off the Black Bay line. And whilst I feel that Tudor have made a lot of mistakes with their watches in recent years, notably the Black Bay Chronograph I think was a very confused watch, um, and similarly one, one saw a, a wide variety of pieces from them which uh, just didn't fit the bill of what Tudor really was all about, this watch absolutely captures the essence of Tudor dive watches from the mid-century. At 39mm in diameter, it's a very, very wearable size, and whilst I like the 41mm Black Bay, I think this version just makes it that little bit more elegant, and allows this watch, which was always a more dressy dive watch than their Pelagos being their, uh, their professional dive watch, to stand out that little bit more. This watch is also only 11.9mm thick, 
And bearing in mind the fact this watch has a very tall box crystal on the top of it, it actually is much slimmer than that already, and so one does see that this watch is far more suitable for more occasions. But aside from being as close as you can possibly get from the Hans Wilsdorf group to a 1950s or 60s Tudor Submariner, this piece is undeniably beautifully finished. It has wonderful polished size to the case, and a very attractive circular brushed grain across the top of the lugs. One also has these, um, these, these rather attractive and, and very delicately executed polished bevels running just along the edge of the lugs to suggest the shape of the case and give a, a slightly more, more intricate form to the watch, which I think otherwise would be lost as a result of, uh, of the, the rather simple shape to an oyster case. The crown protrudes at three o'clock and gives, it gives this, this very easily gripped and also very functional um, placement and of course it isn't, it isn't guarded, which I think adds to the detailing on it, but it's very well supported due to its size, and thanks to the fact that it has that large ring underneath it, there really is very little danger of, uh, of damaging it in this position, as this watch really isn't designed to be uh, an absolutely uh, um, end-of-the-world sort of style of, of dive watch. Instead, this is a more charming sort of offering with a more varied skill set. The bezel is also very well detailed with an aluminium insert, with this gilt and uh, um, red uh, decoration and the pip at 12 o'clock, with its edge being being this coin edge instead of the thicker style one that one would expect to see on later Submariner styles. On the front of the watch, of course, one sees that, uh, that style of box-domed sapphire crystal, and underneath a domed black, matte black dial, which gives you this, uh, this appearance of, of a slightly aged style as a result of having that gilt graduation around the edge of the dial, which is connected, as you can see, in this railway track style of form, whilst the hands also match this in their gilt coloration. And beating behind this watch's solid steel case back is an in-house movement being the MT5402, and this movement was developed specifically to be a smaller version of the existing calibers produced by Tudor in their in-house range. And it should be noted this movement isn't the same movement, it, uh, it really is a re-engineered version, but it features all of the technology that we've come to expect from these modern Tudor movements, and so it retains the, the automatic winding and, of course, the manual winding and, and uh, hacking. But in addition to that, it, it keeps the 70-hour the power reserve that is so excellent on the, the other Tudor in-house movements, which means that you can put the watch down and leave it for a, few, for a few days without the concern of it stopping over the weekend, for example. And I think this is just an attention to detail which is becoming more and more important in the industry, and Tudor really was one of those brands which, which pioneered this technology. Then one has to look at the silicon balance spring, which uh, which increases the accuracy of the watch, but also its resistance to magnetism, for example, as well as having a free sprung balance um, with a, a variable inertia balance wheel. And the purpose of this is to be able to have a balance wheel where you can adjust the weighting of the wheel itself, thus meaning that you can set it more more precisely, but also set it in, in such a way as to make it more stable over time without the danger of the spring changing length, which is the normal way you would you would adjust a, a mechanical movement. And then, of course, one has the additional um, detailing of having a, a balance bridge instead of a simple balance cock, which means, again, more stability for timekeeping. And the price of this watch, I think, is very reasonable, considering the specifications and the detailing, because this watch is £2,340 on a strap, or for the version which I think I would recommend buying, you should spend £2,560 for the version on the steel bracelet, which comes with these rivet-style links, and uh, a very, very substantial build. And the reason why I'd say to go for the bracelet version is because if you buy it on the strap, it'll be it'll be expensive and inconvenient to buy a bracelet to fit it, whereas if you buy the bracelet and change your mind, you can always sell the bracelet for a, a fair amount of money, considering how sought after they usually are. And so with that, I'll conclude the video here. But do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of my choices, and also what you uh, what you might have put in the video instead, because I'm always curious to hear what you think and your opinions on my choices and the various watches I feature in my videos. And if you did enjoy the video, then do please like, share and subscribe to help the channel and also to see more videos and content here in future. And if you're interested in more horological content and, uh, and seeing a bit more of the channel, then do follow me on Instagram at I'm on the Watch Guy. So thank you very much for watching. This is I'm on the Watch Guy, out.